Today we're meeting Albrecht Smith, who is a professor at the University of Duisburg Essen in Germany. He's a professor in pervasive computing and user interface engineering. So for many years, Albrecht has been researching context of air computing. So he's the ideal person to tell us about it. So Albrecht, what is context aware computing? Context aware computing stands for a lot of things. So context aware computing is the notion of having computer system being aware of the context as the word says. And being aware of the context means that you have systems that can recognize, that can perceive the real world using sensors and can act upon those stimuli which they get from the real world. Mm -hmm. And so this sounds very complicated in the first place, but it's, it's, it's fairly simple. So it's the idea what we do all the time. So to navigate your way around, you don't have to be familiar with the place. You know, sort of, you walk uh, between two things which are open, that's probably the door. And so you recognize things and you act upon. So currently computer systems are very often sort of pretty dull. And uh, so a mobile phone will ring whether or not we have an interview here or not. Mm -hmm. A person sitting in the audience will probably not jump in uh, and talk to us because he knows we are talking, we are recorded, but the computer doesn't know. And so I think uh, here, that's the point where we'll see uh, new technologies coming. They perceive the real world and act upon uh, what they see from the real world. So giving the computers eyes and ears mm -hmm. to act and interact more appropriately. That's sort of the basics, what we understand with context awareness. Mm -hmm. So we have computers being aware and telephones being aware, but can you show us some example of how is it working? Yes, there are, there are many products and probably uh, you have used them to come here. Uh, people are using them every day. So for example, if you look at sort of uh, navigation systems, like a navigation system on the phone, this is context aware. What is the context it is aware to? So obviously very simple. It has a GPS receiver in there. It mm -hmm. knows where it is. And by this means it guides you. And the map is moving with you moving uh, around the streets. And so when walking here, when I used it, uh, I had my position and the map was moving. And so sort of this is a basic feature of context awareness. So me as a user, I'm freed from the effort of positioning myself on the map, moving the map around. So the context given by the location mm -hmm. is doing this for me. And that's sort of the basic idea. And obviously, if you look at modern navigation systems, there is much more to it. It's not just the location. If you take into account further contexts, such as the traffic situation, the time of day, uh, and uh, perhaps even sort of uh, what you like and what you dislike. Mm -hmm. So some people rather drive on the motorway than uh, on the small street or the other way around. So this is information, this is context information. And if you have all this context information and you wanna say, I wanna go from Dusseldorf to Essen uh, at yeah six o'clock in the evening, uh, you probably get a good route. And if there's a traffic jam, uh, the system will guide you around. And so all the information that comes in from the real world uh, is what is used to change what you perceive as a user. And this is on one side things like uh, the map and where you are on the map. But this is also things like if it gets dark outside, the navigation system will switch on the backlight so you can still see it. And all these things, which in a traditional computing system, you would have to operate them all yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you have a map on a uh, computer screen, you could obviously do those things yourself. But uh, this is sort of the real power of context aware computing. A lot of the things people needed to figure out themselves can be done uh, by context. Mm -hmm. A further example, if we go sort of towards ubiquitous computing, are lights. So uh, if you go nowadays to a hotel or people have it in their front yard, uh, you, you walk there and the light goes on. And obviously there is very little magic to it. It's basically a switch and it looks, is it dark? Mm -hmm. Is somebody moving? If it's dark and somebody is moving, it switches on the light. And then comes already the tricky part, when do you switch it off? Because if the person stands in front of the door uh, fishing for their key mm -hmm. and not moving for a minute, should it go off? And those are things which get much more complex if you look at more complex context mm -hmm. of systems. But it's again sort of a very simple context of our system uh, in the Ubicom world, uh, automatic doors. Uh, again, and I think the interesting thing is with context of our systems, if they work very well, 
we cease to be aware of and not to be, we cease to be aware of uh, that they're a computer system it's just sort of it works right like an automatic door or the light which switches on whenever you need it and it goes mm-hmm. off that's the interesting part so uh, the system works and it does what you expect and uh, if you're used to it over time you you're not really aware anymore mm-hmm. that there is it's only when it's not working I'll be aware where oh no the light turned off and I'm really yes. I really need it now because I need to find my key exactly that's the point yeah. when it's not working you mm-hmm. will be aware of it yeah. but as long as it's working and I think the automatic door uh, is a really interesting point so people uh, who are yeah going in and out of the supermarket mm-hmm. will probably not give a thought about the door they will have sort of their hands carrying bags or pushing their trolleys but it's interesting if we need this sort of door to be open uh, we go on sort of a, an explicit way of using it so uh, for example if the delivery person comes and he wants to push in crates of fresh fruit he probably takes sort of a, a a piece of cardboard or a tape and sticks it over the sensor so the door stays open and mm. he can do his business. So that's sort of uh, going from this context aware model into an explicit use yeah. where he sort of misuses the sensor by sort of uh, giving the wrong impression of the world. Basically, mm-hmm. the sensor is told sort of the wrong information of the world. And by this, you get into a mode uh, where you switch between implicit and explicit interaction. Mm-hmm. So now we've talked about a lot of things, like a lot of devices, doors and telephones, computers, um, navigation systems. But could you say that there's one goal altogether? Is there one goal altogether for... I think the ultimate goal is, is, is very simple to make the usage of technology easier. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, the, the very big goal is always to make the life easier. But I'm not sure if this is sort of the real nice one. But I think the use of technology to make this, this easier to uh, free sort of uh, users from doing things which the system can uh, can do anyway. Mm-hmm. And I think we have very simple things and that, that was also the first uh, system I built myself. I think when I was a PhD student in 98, uh, we had at that time sort of a, it was called a personal digital assistant. It was sort of what we have now as PDAs or mobile phones. And uh, we put a sensor on where you can sort of, if you had it in portrait mode, Mm-hmm. Your visualization was in portrait mode. If you had it in upright mode, or uh, then the, the visualization was upright. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, if you have it in, in portrait mode, it's portrait. And if you have it uh, horizontal, you have it uh, horizontal. And that was for me something very interesting. That's very simple sensors, just sort of two bits, uh, yeah. which direction you have it. But the effect uh, of this holding in hand, you never have the device the wrong way around. And then when we did some studies, we had very interesting effects like sort of when people were reading it for themselves, they held it like this. But when they were showing it to the other person, they were just flipping it over and the content flipped over mm. instead of turning it around. Yeah. So I think you get new usage patterns mm-hmm. uh, with uh, having devices context aware. So the ultimate goal is to make use of devices, of technology, of systems easier. Uh, to take away burden of usage uh, from from the end user, and that's sort of the the, the overall goal. And uh, the steps getting there sort of things that uh, we know the system should do, and if we can somehow perceive this from the real environment, we try to get this into uh, the system that the system does it automatically. Uh, like uh, with the navigation system, we know the GPS knows typically much better than the user where it is. Mm-hmm. And so it should be sort of the system that puts the point of the user, not the user sort of figures out uh, where he or she is. Uh, similar like a, a backlight we can switch on automatically uh, because we know it's dark and probably if the person works with the system, he wants, uh, wants to read it. Uh, again, similar if you think of mobile telephony. If you uh, speak into a phone and you have a noise around, you want to have different ways of filtering that voice communication. And obviously, you don't want to have the user choosing, oh, I'm in a loud environment or I'm sort of uh, in an environment with uh, a lot of noise from cars or whatever. Obviously, if you have the microphone in there, you can detect the situation and choose your sort of uh, output the voice output and also the filters for the input appropriately to make the speech quality perfect and I think these are the things 
uh, where where we see uh, the, the big potential that we make things easier. And we have seen this uh, in, in many areas. So the automotive domain is one. And uh, the moment things work, people will uh, just sort of not really think about them anymore. That's the goal. That's, that's the goal. The goal is really to make technology easier, to push it in the background, mm-hmm. to uh, not have to bother with it. And I think uh, this relates very much to uh, ubiquitous computing, sort of. And I, for me, uh, context awareness is a central, central enabling technology uh, for ubiquitous computing. And if you look back at the beginning of the 90s, when Mark Weiser published his article, uh, on ubiquitous computing, uh, the work, the research at Xerox Park. It was very much this notion of sort of, yeah, you have a world uh, where sort of computers are everywhere. And now imagine you have to sort of do what you have sort of, uh, all the configuration, all the setting up with each of those computers and you have hundreds of computers around. This is not going to scale because you need 24 hours a day uh, to start your computers and to tell them what they have to do. And so uh, it's very clear, if you have a lot of computers, they must work together and they must sort of be adaptive to the to the real world. Mm-hmm. And there is a, a, a very interesting quote from Mark Weiser uh, about, technologies that disappear and he says uh, they weave themselves into everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it and that's interesting so technology becomes invisible and invisible means in that sense not invisible with it's small you can't see it anymore invisible means you don't really realize that Mm. this technology is there you just use it and most people who are nowadays using a coffee machine or a, a dishwasher or a washing machine they're probably not thinking of, oh, I'm using this 4-bit processor and I'm giving it this 4 or 8-bit processor and I uh, give this input to that system, they're just using a dishwasher. And I think that that's, that's an interesting point. So computing has sort of moved into everyday life. And I think uh, here we see that context awareness uh, is a central point to make things invisible. Mm-hmm. So that we don't have to take care of all those things. Things work automatically. But as you said earlier, it's really a tricky part the moment things go wrong. Yeah. Uh, when people don't act as you think they will. Yes, or systems don't act as you yeah. think they should. Yeah. And you have no idea. So take this example of a navigation system. If you don't have a mental model of the context awareness of the system, so let's say you have a generation one system which only took the, uh, your current position and your target mm-hmm. into account. And it always, basically, if you start it, it always led you a certain mm-hmm. direction. Now you get further context information, like sort of traffic jams. And now you're starting and the car leads you in a different direction. And you think, oh, I know where to drive. It goes the wrong way. Only if you know that sort of there is a, uh, a further set of information, like sort of the, the traffic that there may be a traffic jam that leads to this, you will understand what the system does. So the understandability uh, or the sort of that, that people really realize why a system is doing that. Mm-hmm. that and, and it becomes worse if some of the information is wrong. So for example, if there is no traffic jam yeah. and the system sort I'll of... I'll be very annoyed. The system thinks there's a traffic jam. Yeah. And uh, because it uh, thinks there's a traffic jam or it has in its information that there is a traffic jam, it will lead you a different way. Mm-hmm. And you may even then see that there is no traffic jam. Exactly. And yeah. you will not figure out why that system uh, yeah, led you a, mm-hmm. a certain way. So I think this is sort of the tricky part with context-aware systems. You really have to make sure that people understand what adaptation is uh, to what the system sort of takes in as context input. Mm -hmm. And I think this is sort of, with the systems we have currently out, it's still fairly easy. But if the complexity increases, so things like you may be in front of your office door, which has sort of an automated lock, and it may not let you in. And you may not know why. Perhaps there's a policy, nobody after uh, 10 o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. Or for what are the reasons you may not be allowed in? And so I think that's uh, and that, that's an active research topic of researchers around the world to make context of systems understandable or at least giving them sort of means for explaining themselves mm. uh, to the user so that the users can sort of understand and then react uh, accordingly. Yeah. Okay. So you, men- you mentioned uh, Mark and the Cirrus Park 
uh, in the 90s. Uh, when did it all start, this uh, research into context-aware computing? I, I would really place it around that time. So mm. for me, it started with the uh, research at, at uh, uh, basically Mark Weiss's group of context awareness at the beginning of the 90s. Mm -hmm. The first papers were published, so there was obviously work before. And I think the notion of context awareness uh, is sort of Bill Schillett's paper from 1994. Uh, and his dissertation in '95 that really sort of laid a foundation for context aware computing. And I think he uh, defined the notion. A lot of the work they did at that time was uh, very much about sort of resources and location based finding of resources. But uh, the idea of context that was uh, very much described in that, that thesis. And I think. Uh, this paper from 1994, even though it has only four pages, if people read that one, they probably wouldn't write a lot of other papers. Because uh, most of the ideas about context awareness are in that paper already. And so this is sort of the mandatory read at Bill Schillett, uh, WMCSA, uh, 1994. That's mm -hmm. sort of uh, the starting point for context awareness. And then with uh, the availability of further sensors, especially GPS, uh, more work towards the end of the 90s and 2000 uh, work there. Then sort of, uh, there, there was a project at Lancaster University, the GUIDE project, uh, 97, I think 98, uh, where people experimented with uh, tablet PCs, sort of uh, very large at that time and not very powerful, but having them as sort of uh, personal guide books, electronic guidebooks around the city, and they were context aware. And they tried to go beyond the location, uh, looking at weather conditions, at your personal profile, at opening hours, and so on. I think this is sort of also a further milestone in context aware uh, research. Our own work also around that time, we looked into sort of context beyond location, things like uh, early things with activity recognition, recognition of uses and usage. And we, we wrote a paper on uh, context is more than location, I think, to, to really for us highlighting that sort of there's a lot of potential in there. Uh, at that time also, Anin Day uh, wrote his thesis on context awareness at Georgia Tech. And he explained very well sort of basically everything is context. Mm -hmm. So And uh, context aware applications can adapt to whatever they can really read from the, from the real world or perceive from the real world. And I think from then on you see sort of uh, the first uh, commercial products, as we said, navigation systems as one type of uh, context aware systems. And nowadays uh, mobile phones with acceleration sensors uh, where, yeah, or cameras, you know which way around they're held. Uh, and uh, I think we see now sort of uh, coming more and more of those uh, things which we have seen in research over the last 10 years, basically sensors on devices, vision-based uh, acquisition of real-world context, uh, seeing this going into products. But I think on the research side, sort of uh, the next wave is already happening under the notion of uh, activity recognition or activity awareness, so basically recognizing activities from human movement like walking uh, to things like food consumption or whatever else uh, people do. And I think we see there uh, a next step uh, with sort of interesting sensors interwoven in clothes or worn uh, on the body and also towards uh, the link towards effective computing uh, where we see physiological sensors. So. Uh, things we are looking at at the moment is sort of if we measure stress level of a person, can we sort of uh, change uh, the way they interact with the system? Can we change sort of the, the information we present and so on? So to make them even more stressed. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> or the more opposite, relaxed. I know. hopefully the other way around. But obviously, it's an interesting. Or thing. you could have a... for a game purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this could be interesting. So uh, I just recently heard of somebody uh, doing research. Uh, with uh, thrill rides like roller coasters uh, and having been sort of on the Volksfest, which is in Germany, big thing, uh, over the last days I saw uh, a ride which is basically it's a, uh, it's, it's a wheel 55 meters high with two uh, points where each on each side eight people sit and they go, uh, each of the gondels 
can turn and people are strapped in and it goes very fast and but the interesting thing is it goes uh, the same for everybody in there so you don't get sort of your individual thrill level and I think at Nottingham University they look at sort of in the UK how you would sort of engineer something like this to get sort of an individual thrill level and I could imagine that you can use physiological sensors to really get to your optimal thrill point so mm. if you decide I need uh, adrenaline to get to 180 my pulse mm -hmm. you get the right exactly uh, engineered for you but I think what, what, what we look is look at is more sort of uh, if we see physiological reactions to the usage of devices which we think uh, did tell us something. Again, sort of it's telling us something about the user state. So, for example, if we uh, recognize surprise by changing our lining skin response, uh, or I've seen people looking at uh, uh, brain uh, interfaces to try to monitor surprise and then uh, change systems accordingly. So, uh, if you're surprised, the system may provide you a help component. Uh, or if you are stressed, uh, the system sort of may not pop up yet another email and yet another instant messenger. Uh, it, it may mute some of the mm. stuff that, that sort of your stress level uh, goes down. This sort of is active research which is ongoing over the next years, I think. And I think. But couldn't you imagine uh, a company where you had um, the people in the top wanting their employees to work even harder to make them a little bit more stressed than what was actually good for them? So they would always keep them at a level where they would perform, perform, perform. But I think sort of we, we know that uh, most people don't perform well, well under stress. So I think... Uh, for too long a period, but you could yeah. keep them up there for a while. I think there is there's a lot of research in that. But I, I would guess this, this doesn't make too much sense because you want to have... Uh, in, in most areas, you want to have sort of uh, motivated workforce. Mm. That's the, the key and I think... Uh, there uh, you, you probably don't want to have sort of uh, stress monitoring too much but on the other hand sort of uh, understanding what stresses your employee is is probably a good thing so you you could uh, then sort of uh, yeah change work processes to make them less stressful or mm. but I think that that's a, a quite a quite a different topic going sort of more into effective computing yeah. than into context awareness but from a sensor perspective it's interesting uh, we have seen at the very beginning location sensing uh, outdoor with GPS indoor diverse uh, set of systems and then sort of a lot on uh, acceleration sensors, accelerometers, uh, which are sort of recognizing how a device is held, how it's moved, uh, actions with a device to things like touch sensors, light sensors and obviously a camera is sort of a, a light sensor with a lot of sort of sensing elements uh, and so and I think uh, what we see with more and more sensors uh, sort of becoming smaller, we will see new applications. So you can imagine having sensors uh, like electronic noses that smell things, which are at the moment probably not uh, too big, uh, too, they need too much energy. But if they come, you, you, you can have uh, systems that sort of smell uh, what is around and could act uh, accordingly. I think for me the exciting part is sort of uh, looking into nature there is a lot of sensing uh, not just humans uh, humans have a whole set of interesting sensors perceive the world but also animals that goes uh, even to things that animals uh, perceive magnetic fields etc and I think uh, the exciting point that we have now in research and also in products is that many of those sensors are available but it's really really hard to have the sense making process mm -hmm. and that that's sort of the really tricky point the sense making so obviously if I look at you I recognize you uh, I recognize you are a human you're a woman and so on I, I recognize all these things uh, but uh, for a computer image to do that sort of that's already quite an effort so we have sort of detection of uh, faces we have gender detection there are algorithms by now and I think it's coming together from a lot of sides. So there are algorithms that uh, detect that you're smiling or not smiling mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and those things. And so I think uh, this is just in the vision domain, but we have this in, 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 a, in a whole set of, of sensor domains. And so the, the tricky part in designing such systems is to make it that uh, the computer really sort of can use what the computer is perceiving. So giving an image or giving sort of sensor information to a computer doesn't help if you don't have sort of the process uh, that goes 
beyond that that has the understanding and that's typically you have sort of uh, the step so you have the sensors that that measure the real world that detect the real world and they provide stimuli and then you need some way where the computer sort of classifies this this information taken from that real world situation into a context so for example when you drive a car you will realize even if you have never driven there before if there is an icy patch on the road because you sort of know which features make an icy patch on the road mm -hmm. uh, and this is uh, from a, a computing perspective this is a tricky thing and we go then all the way into machine learning artificial intelligence so uh, how can we detect such situations and the easiest way is sort of you take sort of characteristic situations you store them and whenever you have a new situation you check what is the nearest neighbor mm -hmm. to these situations. And you can imagine to use all the mechanisms we know from machine learning and artificial intelligence for that. And also uh, you have all the problems you know from uh, machine learning. And I, ha I have an example of uh, a mobile phone. So one question was, oh, can we have mobile phones switching themselves off when they go on the plane? Then they detect from sort of uh, perhaps vision or whatever cameras. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they go on a plane uh, and then switch themselves off. And then if you yeah look at many algorithms, if an algorithm is good, they may have 99% uh, of the times they get the right result and 1% wrong or even 99.3%. But looking at a plane with 300 people would then still mean oh, there are a few phones on, mm -hmm. uh, which then sort of may not sort of make this the right application. And maybe my phone would be turned off when I didn't need it to be turned off, which exactly. would be That's, quite annoying as well. Yeah, so I think the, the first uh, work I was doing in that domain was on a European project, sort of uh, a larger project over two and a half years uh, on technologies that enable awareness. And one idea was, can we build a mobile phone that uh, uses context awareness? And one of the use cases was the switching of profiles basically silent, indoor, outdoor, this uh, meeting, these profiles, people typically set and forget to reset them. Uh, and it was interesting to see, uh, you get this sort of with a very high uh, probability, right? Mm -hmm. But typically people are not very forgiving for errors. Exactly. So for example, if you're in a meeting and even with 1% it's still on, mm -hmm or in church or at a funeral, uh, you feel embarrassed and you don't want to have it. Definitely. So uh, people don't like that. And the other way, if you sort of get out of a meeting and you miss calls because the phone doesn't mm -hmm. realize. So th that was one interesting thing that some of those things are really, really hard to do. Yeah. Even so, they look pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Like detecting a meeting and uh, switching the phone silent, you find this a lot in the literature. But it's really hard to get us to a point that it's acceptable. Uh, for users to use because uh, there's so much value to uh, to it. Do you think we will get to that point? I think for certain applications we will not. Mm. Just on, on because I think uh, as yeah, it, if you look at humans, uh, a lot of things we cannot really predict. Uh, so uh, if I have to guess what you want in certain situations, I may not always get it right. And then if this is something which is critical for you you probably want to say, I want to have it this way or that way, rather than me guessing with 95%. Uh, so, but it will be other things where sort of even going beyond 50% uh, is, it, is something which is, uh, which is useful. So for example, take advertising. We did some work on that. Uh, if you have advertising nowadays, if you go to a bus stop and you are uh, standing there, uh, you get advertising, which is sort of, yeah, just a random. Uh, and if it only detects that you are a woman and I'm a man with, uh, yeah, 90%, 80%, 70%, and it can change sort of uh, to typical sort of uh, female male adverts, this is already something uh, very good. And if it gets it wrong, probably nobody... Uh, nobody would notice, actually. Would not even notice yeah. or, or would be sort of uh, bothered. So there are a lot of low-hanging fruits, and I think we see the products mm -hmm. coming in on the low-hanging fruits. Uh, or we, we did one thing where we looked at, um, yeah, music, 
playing in an, in an environment. Uh, if you look sort of, uh, yeah, if, if you play music and you try sort of, if there's more action, you go more towards this, uh, this domain. And again, this is sort of something, if you play music, music randomly, uh, you will go wherever it goes. And if you sort of use the input, uh, how people behave, you may get uh, somewhere else. And, and there are sort of, even sort of a small increase, it's sort of, sort of a gain. And so I think sort of there are things which are uh, low hanging fruit, which are easy to do, where failure is not expensive. Those are probably where we will see the first product and also where I also would think, yeah, grading products is, is quite straightforward. There are other things where we know the system gets it very right. Things like GPS falls under that category, sort of where the system is definitely better in recognizing the world than most users. And that's also a category where products come. A category where products are not likely to come is for me where the users easily sort of can detect what they want, can also easily express what they want, and where the system doesn't get it 100% right. Mm. That's like turning of, your phone on and off, which is yes, really easy yes. for me. And then, but there also context awareness has a solution. So one, so we after sort of figuring out that this is probably not what people want, uh, we figured out that sort of sharing your context information uh, with other people in mm -hmm. your social network is something uh, which is less, much less critical. So basically, uh, updating your Facebook status based on what your phone recognizes is much more precise than what you would probably put in yourself. Uh, and there even sort of having sometimes this wrong is a feature rather than a bug. Because you can always claim oh, the system got it wrong, so you have this sort of notion of plausible deniability. So the system recognizes you're in a bar and you said, I was not in a bar. <laughs> no, I was working, it was just noisy in the, in, in, in the office. Uh, and the, the phone got it wrong. So you have always, so, so there it could be even a feature. Thank you, Elbrick, for passing on your advice today. And uh, if you want to know more, you should read the chapter Elbrick has written and you can find this at interactiondesign.org. Here you can also find more chapters written by other thought leaders and inventors. And uh, you can find more videos like this one as well. Thank you so much for watching.